call to order at 726. At 726. And Jim, you've just taken attendance, right? Yep. So I don't have the agenda in front of me, so I'm assuming it's review of the minutes. Yeah, so uh, special meeting minutes of October 26th, uh, 2021. 2020, excuse me. Any additions, edits to the minutes? No. I move to accept okay. the minutes. Do you have a second? I second it. And minutes are accepted. Thank you. Uh, um, any bills are? Well, we're going to jump right into our guest, uh, Jocelyn Ayer from um, Down Under New Business, because you know then we'll get into some of the other stuff um, from the yep. Town of Morris Housing Plan, and she wants to talk to all the commissioners, um, so she's going to go ahead and do that. I Thank jump you. Right in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry Jump right guys, in i'm sorry you guys have had trouble tonight um and I, I i hope it's okay i'm gonna i think only denise will be able to see it but um i will send you guys these slides afterwards um but it really it helps me uh ma make sure i don't forget to tell you anything so um you guys can see these these those of you that Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm the Community and Economic Development Director for um, the and I am working with um, sorry, this uh, the town got a grant to create an affordable housing plan. And um, I don't know if you all are aware, but back in 2017, the state legislature passed a new law requiring every town to have an affordable housing plan. Um, and so every town has to have them by 2022. And that's why the State Department of Housing made these grants available to towns to go through the process of creating an affordable housing plan. So um, what's on your screen now is just, um, I did assist the town of Salisbury, Connecticut with creating and adopting their affordable housing plan. And, you know, the kinds of things that are in it, um, you know, background in terms of the type, you know, the type and a number of affordable housing units you have in your town now, um, the need for additional units, um, and then usually you know, some goals around how many new units you would like to create over the coming, this would be a five-year plan, um, and then strategies to help um, create those units, which usually include zoning strategies, capacity building strategies, and funding resources. Um, and um, so we're, we're working through the process now. I hope you all got the um, resident housing needs survey. If not, it's still on the town um, website. Um, so we have been surveying residents and we're also surveying those who work in town about their housing needs and their experiences um, with housing in Morris. And there is a steering committee that we're working with um, that includes Tom and Ben Poletsky and um, Kristen, um, uh, the Beach and Rec. I can't remember her last name. Devilla. Devil Devil yep. um, uh, ben uh, Sol 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 Solnit from the Morris Housing, sorry, the Morris Land Trust. Land Trust. And Connie Trolley um, from Inland Wetlands. And obviously she's got a real estate background as well. So that's kind of the steering committee that's kind of helping um, guide the process. But we hope to get lots of resident input as we move along um, on any kind of goals and strategies that end up in the plan. And, in the end, it would be adopted by this planning. Well, the plan, hopefully the planning and zoning commission would endorse it and then adopted by the board of selectmen. 
Um, um, the first thing we always talk about is what is affordable housing. This is the state's definition, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, but um, you know, many people don't know exactly what we're talking about when, when we say affordable housing. So, you know, this is 30% of the income of a household earning 80% of the area median income or less. Um, and this is, according to the state, the town of Morris has 31 units of what it qualifies as affordable housing, which is basically 2% of your total housing stock in the town of Morris. And um, you can see on this slide, which again, I'll send to you kind of how that compares to your neighboring towns in terms of percentage. Um, as you may know, the town or the state encourages towns to have 10%. Um, and um, if you don't have 10%, basically a developer could in theory come into town and kind of override your zoning regulations as long as they were gonna build at least 30% of the units as affordable. Um, so you can see in this, those of you that can see in the slides, can see that um, out of basically the 31 units that you have that are affordable, obviously the 20 that fall under government assisted in this categorization would be Eldridge. Um, and then you have four folks in Morris getting rental assistance and then seven um, Chaffa mortgages. Um, so that's what gets you to the 31 units. Um, this is just quickly showing you the waiting lists. Um, you know, we're working with nine towns in the region right now on affordable housing plans, um, including Cornwall, um, Norfolk, uh, Washington, Warren, Barkhamstead, um, Harwinton. Um, so we're working with all those towns on their own affordable housing plans. And so we went around to all of the um, affordable housing in the smaller towns, not including like Torrington and Winstead to get their waiting lists. And this was in October, so it's kind of a point in time, but we had over 500 households that were on these waiting lists. Um, again, in the smaller towns in our region and almost half of them were seniors um, that were sometimes having to wait five or more years potentially to get off a waiting list. Um, and uh, Jim told me that you currently have about 20 folks on your waiting list for your 20 units or typically do. Um, and that there's often a three or four year wait for a unit at Eldridge. Um, between Eldridge, Wells Run and Bantam Falls, um, there are over 90 folks on the waiting list, seniors on the waiting list. Um, so we know there's a need for additional affordable housing units. Um, you know, this is just one statistic we look at and um, we're doing a full kind of housing needs assessment in terms of looking at the data and um, all of that should be on the, they have a project website for the housing plan and I'm happy to share that with you. All of this information is on there. Um, but just one kind of data indicator of the need for additional housing that's affordable in Morris um, is that about, about 270 households in Morris are currently what's called housing cost burdened. So that means they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Um, so 33% of renter households in Morris and 36% of owner households report being housing cost burdened. Um, you may know that the town um, just recently adopted a new town plan of conservation and development. Um, I actually uh, assisted the planning and zoning commission um, with uh, going through that process as well. Um, and um, so ho hopefully you know this, um, but one of the 
um, you know, one of the goals of the uh, town plan of conservation and development is to increase housing options um, in town, especially for seniors and young families. And one of the strategies that were that is listed in the new plan um, is to study possible expansion options at Eldridge. Um, so that's why we wanted to make sure we talk to you guys <laughs> and, um, you know, to see whether you're willing to consider that possibility, um, you know, as part of this planning process that we're undertaking at the moment. Um, so this is just a map of your, of Eldridge um, and some of the surrounding properties. Um, I guess one of the things I wanted to kind of the more urgent-ish things I was wondering if you all were interested in possibly exploring, which is that, as you may know, one of the, well, there's a couple adjacent parcels to Eldridge that are currently for sale. Um, and um, this one that's more down towards 109, 103 East Street um, is a little, it's two and a half acres. It's currently for sale for uh, about 85,000. And, um, you know, I'm just throwing this stuff out there, <laughs> but I did talk with our, um, and Jim works with him too, um, David Berto from Housing Enterprises, which is um, basically David works with all the local housing organizations in the region um, to get things funded. And I spoke with him today asking whether um, if you all were potentially interested, um, whether he thought we could find grant funding, um, probably from LIS, or there might be a few other options, we could find grant funding to purchase that um, parcel. Um, would you guys be interested in that possibility? Either, for, I guess, probably for, for the potential of additional some kind of additional affordable housing. Um, I know that I've heard that there are well issues, so I don't know, I don't know how well that site perks, but again, that would be part of the due diligence around potential, you know, a potential option to purchase it. Um, but anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm happy to take any questions or comments on either the plan or the planning process or the possibility of you know, this parcel or um, whatever you guys think about this whole thing. <laughs> um, oh, and I just wanna mention, uh, just before I sort of finish up um, to open it up to you all, um, we are having um, as part of this, a series of webinars. And again, I can send this information to you as well. Um, the first one is how is affordable housing funded? And that's actually David Berto. That's coming up this week on Thursday. These are all via Zoom. Um, and so the first one is how is affordable housing funded? The second one is how much affordable housing do we need? And the third one is why does our town's housing not meet the needs of seniors and young people? Um, and they'll all be recorded and available to listen to anytime. Um, but again, you're, anybody who's interested is welcome to attend. We're doing these for all nine of our towns that we're working with. Um, so um, they just require advanced registration. Um, but, and then the first specific forum in Morris that will be inviting all residents of Morris to attend around the housing plan is gonna be March 24th. Um, but all the housing plan steering committee meetings are completely open to the public. So if you wanna attend any of those, they're usually on the second Thursday of the month at 5.30 and they're also noticed on the website and they're, be, they're by Zoom. So if you wanna attend any of those, you're welcome to, um, but this one will be meant for kind of getting residents, explaining why you're, you know, why we're, working on an affordable housing plan for the town. Um, what types of housing does Morris need? Um, results of our survey, the survey that we did. 
Um, and we'd love to have either Jim or any of you come to that meeting just to talk about Eldridge um, and or you know be there to answer questions or whatever that people might have um, if you'd be willing to do that. Um, so that's all I have. Josh, this is Mark, so thank you. And I wish I could see the presentation, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that in an email in PowerPoint. Um, so listen, I, I don't think any of us would ever object to finding a way to install more housing, uh, whether it's for seniors or otherwise, affordable housing, I, sh I should say. I, I mean, our circumstance here, and anyone can correct me if they think I'm wrong, is uh, I don't know how we would ever go about funding it unless you know, 100% of this was through grants. We're, we're, we're kind of working through a circumstance here of, I'll call it, I don't want to say financial neglect, but um, maybe uh, a situation where it's just, it's difficult even just to run the shop right now, right? Uh, and keep the, the, uh, the place in, in shape and, and up, up to um, speed from the standpoint of repairs and so forth. So it's, we have a very, I would say, challenged financial situation now. So uh, anything that we were would contemplate, and, and I've been through this a couple of times in terms of grants and so forth, and, and even when the grants do come in and the, and the money's there, frequently we have to find other resources to make up some sort of shortfall. And at this point, we, we don't have those resources, not really. So um, I'd be, I think we'd all be interested in understanding the financing side. And if there's a way to do this, um, then, you know, I think that's good for the town. Um, but I, it's just, that's a hard, it's a hard nut for us right now to, to think about it. Um, any sort of additional financial stress or expenditure from, for the housing authority. Um, I completely understand that. Uh, just so you know, I'm also a volunteer on, um, the town where I live, um, I live in Salisbury, and I'm on the board of the organization. It's a, it's called the Salisbury Housing Committee, but we're the not we're basically the housing authority. We own the affordable rental housing in Salisbury and manage it. So I totally get it, um, and of course um, we understand that the numbers have to work, um, and there can't be additional burden on, especially on your existing finances. Um, but I think it would be worth exploring with David Berto to see if he could, you know, get the, get the funding um, that would be needed for, for any kind of expansion and or potentially refinancing, you know, if, you know, again, I don't know what you guys, what the financial situation you're in, but um, we don't have we don't carry any debt, uh, at, yeah. which is a wonderful thing, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Right. But we're just what we're trying to do is get our, um, you know, get our operating cost and, and uh, revenue <laughs> in, 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 in a better match than what they are today. So it's, um, you know, we, we we run on a kind of a day to day basis, but, you know, things that are large projects that uh, large repairs or significant <laughs> expenditures, we we're generally looking for grants. Uh, Jim specifically is looking for grants and so forth for things yeah. like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's not the situation we'd like to be in, but it's, it's where we are, right? And yeah. incidentally, I've got my son and daughter-in-law up in Indian Mountains here in a beautiful part of the woods there. And I was just at J.P. Giffords the other day, so. Nice. Yep. I like your neck of the woods. Oh, you said Salisbury, didn't you? Yeah, sorry. That's all right. Well, you know. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. They're close. And one of the things I, I have worked with with Dave a little bit, we got involved with something in Litchfield. It didn't progress because the funding rounds kind of got really changed with, with the new governor. We didn't know which way they were going to go. Um, so we didn't finalize anything. Um, but, you know, listening to what he has to say is at least the, the start of, of trying to get funding for, for something. My question to, to Jocelyn is if, you know, before we, we get engaged with the conversation about purchasing land, we need that land to be, you know, like you had mentioned, we, we have historic well problems, water problems there. Right. If we yeah. did some type of feasibility study on the land itself, who would, who would be on the hook for some of those costs? Um, well, I can tell you, again, I can give you a very current example of what we're doing here in Salisbury with the, you know, the nonprofit 
that I'm on the board of that runs the existing affordable housing, we're proposing a new site in Lakeville. We have a pre-development loan, which turns into a grant once the, basically a grant um, from the Department of Housing for, I think it's $250,000 to study the feasibility of that site. Um, and then once we get permanent financing, which would be a grant um, for a construction of the site, that pre-development loan is rolled into all of that because every, every, no affordable housing project can really um, work with um, any kind of debt. <laughs> so it all has to be, you know, grant funded. Um, so um, that's how we're that's how we're proceeding for studying the feasibility of this site in in Lakeville. Um, you know, again with grant and. You know, the idea would be to get an option to purchase, obviously, and not purchase the site, if possible, until you had everything worked out and you knew that it made any sense. Um, so that's what, you know, that's what Dave, exploring the option with David would be him getting the pre-development funding, um, helping work on an option to purchase, all of that stuff. Um, and he actually recently just did that with the new Bark Hampstead Housing Trust in Bark Hampstead, who purchased a farm um, that they intend to to build affordable housing on there. So he's worked with the Litchfield Housing Trust before as well. Um, yeah, I mean he works with almost all of the local housing organizations. So what would be the next step? Is is it just talking to to Dave? Um, said, yes, we're potentially interested in at least gathering information um, and then having him come back with us. That this is how X, Y, and Z would work. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're interested in at least in not, if you're interested in at least exploring the possibility, um, you know, maybe David could come, you know, explore again. He can look into the possible funding sources and then come back to you um, okay. at, a, at a future meeting. So I can put a call into Dave um, probably at this point sometime next week and we can, you know, say, yes, let's, let's look at these options to purchase the land um, and, and really explain our concern over, we don't have any reserve money that that can go into a, yeah, a project. That won't, that won't surprise him. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and it's the exact conversation Mark I had with Jocelyn about, three hours before our meeting. So <laughs> I told her that I, that's exactly what our concern is. So Jim is. was not fibbing. <laughs> I, to I totally get it. I, I look at our own financials. <laughs> I know how tight they are. Um, Jocelyn, I, I have a quick question. Based on, on all the numbers that you guys have and the, and the amount of housing that we currently have in Morris, what do you think the number of units that they're, they're targeting to get in Morris additional? Well, we haven't started talking about a unit goal yet. Um, and that will be part of the public process is to talk about, you know, what's a reasonable goal to have. Um, you know, I mean, I think over a five year period, again, because I, there, I, there is some funding, mo most of the way that affordable housing gets funded is through the, the, the State Department of Housing. And they only have so much funding to go around. So. I would say a reasonable, I mean, if you want me to tell you what I think a reasonable goal would be, I can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just just I to give us some some guidance, you know, you, you ran the numbers and and not everybody can see the the slides that you had up. Yeah. So, you know, we're at what, 2%, about a little over 2%. So yeah. if we were to get up to the proper percentage, what, what, is, what is that reasonable number? Oh, well, I, I don't think getting up to 10% is reasonable. Um, and I would say that to all of our towns in the town of Salisbury, where we worked on the plan, I think we're, we're at about 2.5% as well. And we're, our goal is to get up to 5%. Um, Salisbury has more overall housing units than Morris. And so our goal was 60 units over 10 years. So that would be 30 units over a five year period for a town like Morris. And again, this is all to be worked out during the planning process, but 100%. I would start with a goal like 10 to 15 units. Um, 
you know, over a, a five year period would be great. Um, be better than zero. <laughs> no, absolutely. But that at least gives us, you know, everybody a little perspective on what it is. Yeah, we're not talking about 100 units or 200 units or and I, I wouldn't talk about that because it wouldn't be a realistic goal anyway, it would just get people worried. And it, it wouldn't happen. So um, but that's all, you know, all part of the process is, you know, the first public meeting, which is, I think, I think I said March 24th, um, that'll be just like letting residents know this is what's going on. We're doing a housing plan. This is why. This is what the process is going to be. And then the second one will be when we've had a chance with the steering committee to really think about how many units we'd want to create over the next 10 years and what are some strategies for getting there. Um, and again, I think if you guys are open to the possibilities of expanding at Eldridge, it's a lot more focused goal than, you know, where else is, where else, you know, um, kind of opening it up to. Um, so you mentioned, and I thought it was 200 and change. Uh, was that households there, or, or we'll call it under the stress of 30% or more of, of the student housing? What was that figure again, please? Yeah, the cost burdened households, I think it was 200. 270. Yeah, almost 270. 270. Yeah. That's gotta be close to 20% of the households in the in the town. Yeah. What, what well, are we I like 2,300 in population? Yeah, I think so it was. You have do you have demographic information on that group, by the way? Um, You mean like what incomes they're earning, for example? No, like age groups and so forth. So I'm thinking about, I mean, yes, we fulfill a need here in terms of senior housing, but it'd be nice to know what the, um, I, I would say the uh, constituency that could be of, you know, this could be of most value, right? So is it mostly seniors that fall into that? Is it mostly younger people that fall into that category? So age age is really more what I'd be interested yeah. in. Yeah. Again, I think you guys have so few currently affordable units in town that, um, I mean, you know, we, we have done a lot of um, data and demographic um, looking at trends and everything, but I think you have a lot of need at both ends of the spectrum, both seniors and um, younger yeah. folks. Um, so, but I, that is all part of the housing needs assessment that I did. I actually presented it at the last steering committee meeting and that will be part of that March 24th meeting as well. But I can send you, I can send you guys those slides um, too. It has a lot of that information in it. Um, I, don't, Thank I you. don't have specific cost breakdowns. That that question is on the American Community Survey about whether your housing costs burdened or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think they break that down by age category. Um, Do we know how that compares to towns of a similar size or in the Northwest Corridor? Are we, you know, do we, where do we fall on the continuum here? In terms of number of like percentage of housing the Percentage costs? of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I no. I it's pretty. It's pretty similar. Um, but I can you know th there's this, actually this great tool that um, the Partnership for Strong Communities has where you can compare yourself um, to any other town in the region or to the county and the state as a whole. Um, so I could do that for you. Um, I don't have the numbers in my head though. Thank you. Is that property the one that as you walk uh, driving into Eldridge Road, the property on the left and that connects to the back of the seniors now? I think so. Were you able to see those pictures that I had on? Yeah. The, yeah, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't match the pictures up. Um, but I can look. You said it's one hundred and three. Yeah, and, and you're and you're one hundred and nine. Yeah. So it's got to be got to be close. I think you know, it's got to yeah. be right there. Yeah, I think there's a piece of that property when you go into Eldridge Road. That piece on the left is for sale, but I think it comes to 109 between that house on the edge of Eldridge and uh, the doctor. 
There's a, a, I think, because there's a for sale sign there and a for sale sign on Eldridge. So that must be okay. all one piece. Okay. Like kind of behind where that big China storage unit is? Yes. Okay. Well, that, I think, isn't that unit on that property that's for sale? It, it yeah. could be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That in the description. Yeah. Okay. So it does go left when you pull into Eldridge. It's, it's past the house to the left. Right. But then yeah. it comes in between i think the two houses the house on the left and then up the street the, uh, the there's okay. two houses i think it's in okay. between there because it is what'd you say two and a half acres yeah um and there is actually another parcel as you may know behind eldridge um oh, okay. it's also for sale but it's for sale for a lot more money <laughs> it's, a it's, lot, it's, it's a lot wetlands too land. And it's wetlands, isn't it, more? I don't know. I don't think I've ever been really back there much. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It says it's, I think it said 37 acres. Well, that's big. And it's uh, like $500,000 they want for it or something. So wow. um, anyway, you know. This is um, a start. <laughs> they yeah. should donate it, you know. <laughs> That nice. So that is a pretty cool tool. I'm actually on that site for housing data, and uh, it's it's over a third of our of our residents are in cost burden situations, and the right. renters and and uh, homeowners are about the same. But that seems pretty consistent, unfortunately, regrettably. Um, of all the towns, I'm looking at the contiguous towns. Actually, Litchfield's a little bit worse than we are, which is a little yeah. surprise. Yeah, actually, Washington is is really bad, interestingly. Um, so, oh my God! Yeah, forty-one I mean, percent. Yeah, there's wow. a lot of need, <laughs> um, and so I sort of feel like anything, you know, if we can figure out with each town what's a reasonable, you know, what what could be reasonable, and then you know get the state to fund it, that would be my goal. <laughs> um, obviously, it's easier when you can find a specific site. Um, uh, and, you know, really think about that site rather than just a plan that kind of leaves it up in the air where it's going to end up. Hypothetical. Yeah. Well, I think that gives us a little direction okay. on, on kind of next steps um, on our end um, to, a, to obviously a greater goal. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Jocelyn before we jump into some financial stuff? And I will, I'll send, I'll email you, Jim, all the slides. Um, okay. And I'll just did. forward it to all the commissioners. That, yeah. And I'll make sure cool. everyone's make, you know, knows about the, the 24th. And again, if you want to join any of the other housing plan steering committee meetings, you'd be more than welcome okay. to do that as well. And hopefully they'll be more successful in terms of being able to get into the Zoom call. Yeah. <laughs> <tonight>. <laughs> some, some are hard with an 18 month old, but. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll make some of them work. Everything's hard with an 18 month old. Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna make you host. Okay. Wow. This is a really cool site, by the way. We lost Denise. Oh, we did. Why did that happen? Well, that's not good. She said she's from Salisbury, 17%, one of the lowest in the state. Unless you count renters, and it's 42. Oh, she's coming back. All right, are you good, Jim? Yep, we, we should be all set. Thank you for for presenting that and, and giving us, you know, the guidance for to, to start the conversation at least, and we'll um, I'll keep you informed and, uh, you know, if I have a conversation with Dave and, you know, we'll go from there. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you, Jocelyn. You want to, you want to move back to unfinished business or to stay in new business, Jim? Let's jump, jump to the state report on our new business since Gwen's with us. And then once she's done, 
and we're done talking about the, the financial stuff, then we'll jump back to uh, the rest of the meeting when she leaves us. Sounds good. So Gwen, hey, and Gwen. I, hey, how are you? Um, she's going to go over and again, she's going to share her screen, but we'll, we'll go into details about some of the numbers and I'll let her start and then we'll kind of both talk about a few things. All right, Jim, you have to go and allow me to share my screen. So if you go to share screen, should I make you co-host? No, nope, we don't have to. You should just be able to say, um, I can put you in the waiting room. <clears throat> no, thank you. It's not gonna help. There's a there. You need to give me the ability for participants to screen share. Okay, I don't know how to. I'm making you co-host. Okay, that's fine. So you can do it. Okay, so can every all of you who can see, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I have here is the budget to actual of the January to December, 2020. And what we'll do is we'll just kind of go over the pieces that, now Jim, did you email these to everybody? I did not. Do you want to take my email and forward it? I was just about to do that. Um, let me see what I can do here. Hold on. For, for so, right now, I'm just going to send it to Mark and if Eugene and, and Eugene, and then we can send it out um, um, to everybody after since Denise is on. on. Okay. So Mark, I just sent you Gwen's reports and same thing with Eugene. So if you could bring those up, if you're at a computer, you can follow along with us. Okay. Yeah, just waiting for it to come through. Yeah. So in the in the big picture, um, there's there's numbers here that um, were forced to report a certain way. So they they look a little bit odd, but we're going to explain them to you as to why they're there um, and where the other side of that is. So the the beginning um, we start with base rent and. You know, right now your base rent is higher than what we had budgeted, and that's because you had new people moving into units. Um, your excess of base is lower because more people are at base rent, which means there's less excess. Um, but that is the trend that we're we're always shooting for. That the remember the end goal um, ultimately is that you can survive off of base rent. You're not quite there, but we seem to be making steps closer and closer. Um, vacancy loss is a little bit higher, but I, I believe that I would attribute that to COVID not being able to turn the, the unit around as quick. Um, so then there's a, a 10,000, almost $200 in other income. That, that number there is basically the amount of money that the tenants paid for the improvements. So what happened is there was improvements that what they wanted to do that weren't in, in your budget. They said, we'll pay for them. So the housing authority arranged for it and they reimbursed for those costs. So that is equivalent to sort of like a grant. Um, laundry money is it's about $225 shy. And we never know when those checks are coming in or how much they're coming in. So sometimes we're a little bit over, sometimes we're a little bit under. And then there's grant income and it's about just shy of 36,000. And what, what that is, is that is um, the RSC grant, that is the CHFA grant, 
That is the Eversource grant. That is the food pantry grant. Jim, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, we can. Um, so the, the, as, as we've talked about in our last few meetings, um, the, the Eversource grant was based off of the energy incentive for some energy work that we did in the community room. And then I got that matched through the CHFA grant. So both of those numbers are in there. Um, the food pantry grant was when we were, when we had that up and running, we got $600 from CHFA. And then the RSC is, is what we've always had from Department of Housing. So um, all in all, that's, that's a pretty good chunk in, in one year for, for some, for grant money. We have not spent the CHFA grant money yet. And, and there's a few reasons why, but I, and I'll get into that when we get into my report, but it's a combination of um, COVID and then we got hit with the winter because a lot of the projects are outside. Any questions so far? No. Okay, I know it's late. Try to keep it brief. Numbers will just put everybody <laughs> to sleep. So um, salaries are on track. The RSC is on track. Um, we come down to electricity where electricity is actually lower. And, and the reason that that is, is because of that grant that we just changed everything in that community room. So now the electric should be lower and there's a propane bill now, but it doesn't, it shouldn't, it should still be less than adding the two together to where we were. So right now in terms of electricity or, or fuel usage for the community room, we've saved over $1,300 um, for when we put that in to this point. Wow. Yeah, I, I anticipate it will be, you know, it's definitely a, a great decision made for long-term. <clears throat> Especially since you got grants for, you know, the, the big portion of it. Um, repairs payroll is down and that's because COVID there wasn't as much happening. Um, repairs contracts is up. And part of that is because some of the improvements that we did for those units that the tenants paid for qualify to just be expensed versus being depreciated. And the threshold on that is 2,500. So if it was under 2,500, it got expensed. If it was more than 2,500, it's depreciated. Um, snow removal is just off one month. I think that's more of a timing issue. Um, so the food, the food pantry money is here, separate line item, the, the money that was received is, is up above. So basically Morris kicked in $29 and 61 cents to that project. We tried to get as close as we could when he ordered from Napoli Foods. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so realistically on paper, um, you know, you, you sort of have a 40, almost a $44,000 profit, but then we have to depreciate anything that was capitalized. So you're showing a, um, a $10,000 loss versus a $6,000 gain, but we don't allocate for depreciation in that, in that profit because the state doesn't look at it. You have to still have to conform to the gap guidelines, but on the state report, we don't actually report it. So these are, these are probably some of the best numbers that we've had in a while. Um, I definitely see improvement since, since I've started and Jim started. And, you know, if we can get the base rents up, then I think, you know, it would be so much more of a cushion. You're not struggling every time we have to pay the bills. There's a little bit of cash mm -hmm. in there. And we're going through the base rent increase right now with the recertification. Um, the other thing that's, that's definitely helped over the last um, I, I would say two months as we had 
one particular resident have their rent go up a little over $800. Um, they got married. In increased by $800? Correct. Um, they got married, and now I have to count the spouse's income. So that has definitely helped in the last few months. Was this a circumstance where they were cohabitating, not being married before? And in that case, is this no, how did getting married? It was, it was a very okay. weird situation, but she was technically not living there until recently. And there's immigrations involved, but the way okay. that we have to do it is she's added to the lease as a non-qualifying member of household because she's younger than 62. Um, but her income counts to the household. Um, so we, we've been able to pay some significant bills with, with that extra money. Um, okay. So it's, it's, you know, that's been... Sounds like a formula we try to adopt elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Just um, kidding. But I don't know how long it's going to last because, you know, with what they're paying, they could probably find something in fair market that's close. So um, it's going to be nice while it lasts. Mm -hmm. So the other report that I'll pull up is the balance sheet. And we'll compare that to last year. And you can see some of the changes in the values. Uh, Mark, I'm not sure that you have this, but I have liabilities and equity. There's a balance sheet assets, balance sheet. Yeah, I don't think I gave that as a comparison um, at the okay. time. I think my screen has locked up. Oh, wait, here we go. Um, so the, the banking balance between prior year and this year is is down. Actually, it's up two grand. We have moved. <clears throat> we took some of the money from the reserves this year and we put it into the stiff in hopes that we were going to get more interest. And right now, I think the stiff interest is terrible as well. Very, very low. Um, the total improvements that we have on the books this year is just under 26,000. And Jim has the breakdown of that of how much is the community room versus, uh, I think, a little over or just under 7,000 is one of the improvements to the flooring in one unit. Yeah, so the, the high-tech mechanical invoice, that's the company that did the um, new heating system and hot water system. It was like 14,600. Um, and the grant money that we received from Eversource covered 75% of that project which is excellent when you look at getting energy incentives to balance off the cost of your project. And then we've already saved 1,350 um, in energy savings and, and Morris ultimately put in $3,700 to that project, um, but we've already saved 1,350. So it's looking a lot, you know, right now it's 2,400 um, to, to do that whole system and I would say in the next year we're going to make that money up um, just in energy costs so um, I was uh, after running all the numbers 75 percent is one of the highest projects that I've done where Eversource has has contributed their incentives to the project um, so that was excellent to see that balance so Based on all the income, all the additional income that we took in for the um, CHFA grant, the Eversource grant, the money from the tenants for the renovations um, or improvements, you're still at a positive number if we don't include depreciation. Um, Jim, how much of that Eversource grant have we not spent yet? The Eversource is, is completely spent because that project is 100% is done. The okay. matching front funds from CHFA, um, 
have not been spent. And that's similar to the 14,500 ish. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking that right now we're in an audit year. So 19 and 20 are about to get audited. Yeah. And we're probably going to have to accrue those expenses back to 20. Yes. Yeah. So even, even at that point, you know, if I go back, so this is figure 26 for improvements. If we go back to the report of budget versus actual, we were at 40, almost 44,000. And that was 26,000 in improvements. So that leaves us 18. And if we have to spend another 14 or 15, you're still plus three. Um, which I think is huge for you guys. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely watching the P's and Q's and, and every penny, but with Jim finding these grants, it's like unheard of that we were able to do what we could and still, still survive. And the report back in, when did we meet? October? Um, did we sound with a lot, our voices had a lot more gloom in them than, mm -hmm. than they do today, for sure. Um, you know, there's not a lot of pending bills that our operating budget can't handle. Um, Eversource is one that with having to pay these vendors, some of these vendors before we receive the grant money, um, that we, we kind of fell behind in a little bit, but we're, we're all caught up um, with, I think all of our um, accounts payable to, to pretty much to date, right, Gwen? Yeah, everything at this point is current. And we, we haven't been able to say that in some A long time. time. A long time. Good news. Yeah, it's great. Um, now I don't know. I don't know if if the state of if you want to talk about this feasibility uh, and the additional units. I I don't know if the state is giving out one hundred percent grants anymore. Um, and the reason I say that is I'm I'm doing work with another housing authority and they were given. Um, I think 2.5 million to do some renovations, but only part of that was given as a grant, the rest was a loan. And because of the way it's structured, there's a new cost analysis that has to be done at year end. And if there's more cash flow, so if they, if they basically are receiving extra cash and they have more cash in the bank than they do bills, then they have to give a portion of that money back to CHFA and to reserves because they got that grant. Yes, I've, I've heard most of the, but they're, they're, the housing authority getting a situation like that, it can be forgivable. Um, if you make a, a profit, then you owe part of that profit back to the state. So right. it's, it's still, if you're not making money, you don't owe anything. So right. you know, th there's, there's a little give and take there. You're getting all this money and they want some of it back if you succeed with it. Um, so you're not in, in debt right off the bat with, with something like that. Oh, no, they, they actually have a mortgage on top of that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I really don't know. We, I've never really been involved with some of the funding now, but I, I think it's worth a conversation with Dave to really understand how some of that stuff works. And if it's not something that we're comfortable getting involved with, then you know we, we stop the conversation. But I, I think he especially knows a lot more than, than I do about this particular item. He does this every day. I don't do it very often. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a great opportunity for the town. 
um, you know, I guess I, I, I only say, make my statements to make you understand that there may be that possibility that you're not going to get 100% financing. And I don't know how they allocate or we come up with base rents on those units in order to afford that loan, I guess is more the question. Yeah, and there's all, there's all formulas for that based off of, um, you know, there, there's all sorts of, you know, they look at that number and then they, they kind of work off that number. What do those units need to take in <clears throat> in order to um, succeed? And that's not necessarily, um, we might not give the affordability that we do now with new, new units. They might need to, need to be rented at $750 or $800 to be, to have the sustainability of kind of the money that you, you ultimately owe HFA back. So there's a lot of moving parts to get involved with some of that. Yeah. Part. I, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful thing for the town, um, but the town does have a resource right now in senior housing and they don't have affordable housing. I don't think anywhere else. Right. And, and I think, you know, getting us this situation just back on its feet between you two in particular, um, and we're just getting over the hump here. I, you know, I've just had too many experiences with these, these projects that, you know, they end up dipping into your pocket more than they think, you think. And to your point, Jim, if you can't make it affordable, then what, what's really the point? Right. Yeah, it's, it's affordable um, for your market, but it's not affordable for what you're familiar with. It doesn't gear towards um, extremely low income or low income. It gears towards, you know, moderate income, to the affordability. Yeah. And sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not in your market. And so you, there's just so much that you have to be aware of when you when you dive into to any of this stuff. Um, and I know the familiarity. Mark, you were with the small cities grant when I, I think it was portrayed as kind of a hundred percent grant and then it dipped significantly into savings or the reserve when you had to pay with architect engineer and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, and tens that, of thousands of dollars. And you know, forty forty thousand um, dollars into savings is a big number for us. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a number we don't have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, personally, I'd like to see us just keep keep working at getting this place into better financial order, yeah. and and you know get get, get a operating <laughs> as I say revenue and cost lined up better, uh, build some reserve, and then maybe we can start thinking about something like that. But yeah. I think the town does have other needs that they could you know prioritize in terms of affordable housing in front of them. I mean, to me, to me, you if you can. If, if someone could wave the magic wand and get that piece of property that's abutted to it and you um, can put in another 15, 20 units, I'm not sure what the size of the, the property, how many units that would hold, but you have to understand, Mark, that if you, let's just say you doubled the units, the, the amount of, of costs isn't necessarily going to double. Right. And if you're you scaling it at that units, point. Yeah, you could get more units, then a lot of the costs become more cost effective on a per unit basis. Yep. Um, so, and, and they're not looking to do it tomorrow. So I think over a five to 10 year, if there's some kind of a way to make that happen, I think it would be, I think it, you know, overall it would be beneficial because again, your cost per unit for a lot of things go down. You know, it's not like your snow sure. plowing is going to double um, because right. you had another road. But um, but and I I think you're yeah. I think we had this conversation at the last meeting. You're falling under so many minimums right now that the extra units I don't think is going to be that much more costly. Um, and the, the one thing too that that we can all remember is. Um, when we talk about land acquisition and, and all these financial things, we can go in executive session um, at our next meeting and so forth. So we can, we can really have a conversation about some of that stuff, um, you know, in, in our private conversation. Um, okay. 
So, Gwen, is there anything else we wanted to, to cover? The, the state report reflects this uh, budget versus actual that, that Gwen showed and, and described. Um, I, have one, I have one change that I made tonight before the meeting, which I'll, I'll uh, update the state report, Jim, and I'll resend it to you. And that was just moving the, the propane costs. So there's like $500 that was sitting in air contracts instead of propane. So I just moved it. But I'll, I'll send you new reports. Okay. So, uh, any questions? I know no, you guys thank love you. These numbers. <laughs> well, I like them a lot better than we used to. When, so. <laughs> when, when I realized that, that we had no bills to be paid, I called Gwen and I was like, has this ever happened to us before? <laughs> <laughs> what did we do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the stars are aligning. It's a good. It's a good thing. That is a good thing. And and what we've done, yeah, what we've done too, Mark is is we've we've taken that money that we didn't spend for the um, CHFA grant that additional fourteen thousand dollars, and we've kind of from a bookkeeping standpoint, just taking it out of the, the check register so that we don't think we have that to spend. Mm -hmm. um, it's still sitting I in the bank account, but in my check register uh, as of today to 15, it's it shows a little bit less than what the bank shows just because we've, we've just kind of said that we've already spent it knowing that we're going to spend it. And so that we don't, we don't allocate that money to someplace elsewhere that it shouldn't be yeah. exactly um where in the past i don't think that um you know before me i don't think that necessarily happened i think in the past if there were still checks in the checkbooks we figured we had money in the account so. <laughs> <laughs> oh it doesn't work that way <laughs> I, I, you know it should not out of checks what do you mean should I, I should be able to write more yeah no, it's been it's been really fun to watch it get back and to get into into financial order. I'm not sure it's ever been back since I've been here, frankly. Yeah. Jim, I think road. Denise yeah. wants to talk and she's muted. Oh, I muted her. Can you unmute yourself, Denise? Yeah, there you go. There you there go. go. Well, I just wanted to say that I got a new phone, Gwen, so I'll have to see when you send the bills that I can do them. If, if not, I'll let you know. Okay, well, if you got a new phone and it should have an app maybe for bill.com. I'm, I'm hoping everything went over. So far, everything has. The only thing is my emails are not. I'm gonna have my daughter do that tonight. It, it's, they, I never used my Gmail. So I use my app online and it's not on the phone, but she did it to my husband's phone last night. So I'm going to have her do mine. And, and then I hope hopefully it'll go. I'll probably approve bills on Wednesday. So I'll All right, you, so I'll watch for that. Yeah, I'll send you a quick email when I do that. So then you can look and see if, if you have any problems, then then you can call Gwen's office or, or Sally and see if we okay. can get them fixed. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you hooked up if, if something's not working properly. Okay, I just figured I'd give you the heads up. No problem. We can take care of that. That's easy. <laughs> um, so if there's nothing else on the financial report, we just need a motion. Um, and then we will send this into the state by the end of this week. I make a motion to accept the state report. I second it. Accepted. All in favor? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> that would be that would be me that's left, I think, right? <laughs> okay, well you guys have a, a great night. You know where to reach me if you need me. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, go ahead. Right. Thank you. All right, Jim. I don't know if I need to do anything special to to not be hosting anymore. Um well, I guess I just, just took you off a co host. Okay, so great. All you right, you guys leave and, and we're all set. Okay. All right. Thank you okay, very much. Thanks, Gwen. Good night. Good night. All right. So I'm just going to, since it, since we, we had a little technical difficulty at the beginning, I'll just run through my stuff pretty quick. Um, 
we have to be very careful in, in Zoom meetings and special meetings. If I don't have something listed outside of my report, um, then I can't, I can't report on it. So I'm just going to hit everything in my report and then hit some of the other stuff in unfinished business. And then the one item left in new business. Um, so first thing I wanted to mention to everybody, our asset manager at CHFA has, has once again changed. Um, it's somewhat unfortunate when that happens because the new person coming in doesn't know the, the, the work that you've done um, throughout whatever period they were our asset manager. So we had Penny Fisher for four years and she really saw what we've done, what it was when we started and what we are today. Um, so we have a new, a new person, her name is Kim Black and she's been at CHFA for 30 ish years, but she hasn't been on the asset manager side of it. So they're going to kind of work together, familiarize Kim with, with our property. Um, but th there is always a little bit of a learning curve there when, when you get somebody new, um, collecting your data. So I just wanted to mention that to everybody. Um, I, I don't think we had full occupancy at our last meeting, but but as of today, all 20 units are full. Um, we are going through, like I had, had briefly mentioned, recertification and our rent increase. Recertification, everybody get, received an envelope there to put their financial data in that envelope and give it to me in my office underneath the door. Um, and I'll calculate their, if there's a rent change, um, via that process or determined through the rent increase if their rent has a chance to go up through through that. Um, our public hearing for the rent increase was February 5th. Um, I did not need any commissioners present. It's, it's not a, an actual meeting. I call it a public hearing where residents can come in, voice their concerns about the rent increase or submit written statements about the rent increase. Um, no statements were, were given to me and nobody attended the meeting in regards to the rent increase. Um, both Jim and Deb Lafreniere joined the meeting, but they had nothing to say about the rent increase. So I just, in the minutes of that public hearing, I explained the rent increase, say that there's no public comment, no residents attended with comments, and I submit those to CHFA. Um, that's the last step before we receive approval on the rent increase that the board, you guys approved at our last meeting. Um, so we're just waiting to hear from the state um, on that. Um, the last two things definitely came up after the, the last meeting. Um, and, and Mark, I think this is kind of, you were on the board when this decision was made and, and if you can explain it a little bit to me. Um, I just want to understand it a little bit more. There's a fence between units 16 and 17. Um, and what, what prompted this is the woman in unit 16 wants the fence removed. Do you remember that fence being approved to go up? No, Jim, I, I, I couldn't tell you, honestly. So, so what I think, and I, I asked a few different people is, I think it's a really bad wind tunnel there. So that's the reason the fence was put up. And it, especially in the winter, there's no snow drifts that, that go into that space. Um, Jim Lafreniere said that that's the exact reason it went up to, to kind of as a wind blocker for, you know, between those two units. And same thing with Mike from Mike's Plowing. He said that that's why it was put up. Um, so I just wanted to see if any of the commissioners remember that getting put up so I can respond to the woman that wants it taken down and say, no, there's a reason it was put up. It was before my time. Listen, I think if, if we've got Mike, or, you know, that says yeah. that's what it is and Jim, I would, I would trust that, that okay. information. I just didn't know. If what, there was what's the, is there a, is a particular reason the resident wants to take it down? So she's having a lot of mobility problems and she's in unit 16 mm -hmm. and there's a lot of steps going down to where her vehicle is or where she would get picked up. So she really needs to use the back entrance. Um, and she wants that to be able to, to use as she goes out her front door, she can use that to um, have people come and go. So they don't come right into her bedroom 
and, and to, to enter her unit. Um, that's her reasoning for it. But I think the, the, the fence was put up for a reason um, and, and would cause less other issues if it were to stay. Okay. Um, so I'll just respond to I mean, her. If, if we have, so I think what we need to think about is if we're getting mobility issues is, yeah. you know, maybe changing apartments at some point here, really, right? Yeah, and that, that could be could be an answer um, or, or, you know, her back door is, is convenient, but she doesn't want her aides and helpers to have to go right through her bedroom to get into her, her house. I can appreciate that. Yeah, so there, there's a few things going on. So, so do you want me to mention that in the letter that she can apply for a relocation um, if, if that comes? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's a mobility issue, I mean, that seems like a reasonable thing to do, right? Okay, so the fence is to stay, but we're giving her an alternate option of, of relocation upon the next available Give unit. her a first right of refusal of the first, yeah, okay. accessible unit or, or different unit. Okay. Because some, some, you know, like Herb, um, you have 15 steps you have to walk to. So I'll, I'll go through the particular units that would, would be easier to access and, and, and we'll have that conversation. Um, the other issue in, in is it, we were having a significant parking issue between buildings and it's with the same resident because she doesn't want to park where she can't walk to. So she's parking in the other parking lot that's in front of a different building. I, my response has always been, there's no assigned parking. You can kind of park where you need to park, but there is specific parking areas in front of different buildings. So when somebody else parks in their spot, um, they get very frustrated. So we're having that issue right now. Um, again, it's a mobility issue where the woman wants to park. Um, and, and I've kind of been steadfast on there's no assigned parking. Um, and, and those are our rules. So um, do, do any other commissioners have any input? Because the woman's not parking in front of her, you know, where the kind of the parking lot was built, where the unit is. Um, and they're like, the residents. Which means she's parking me. someplace which is not as convenient either. So, I mean, there are, there is no assigned parking. I, get, I guess we all have our favorites where we prefer, but <laughs> unless we have assigned parking, she's within her rights to do that. Yeah, and that, that's what I've said, and, and residents are, you know, the one particular resident is the one that was got married, so now he has two vehicles, because um, they each have a vehicle, so the, the so it, it's just more of an annoyance than anything um, to the resident, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll respond back to them that there's no assigned parking, um, and that that's what that's what the rule is. I know when when Janet and Herb lived in, in Bantam Village before yeah. they came to Morris, uh, if you could have one car in front of your unit, and if you had a second car, it was in a, a in a different parking area for second cars. Yeah, I just don't know where that area would be because we don't yeah. really have visitor parking at Eldridge. It's all just laid out in front of the strip of units. Um, so we really have four parking lots um, and visitors kind of park where open spots are and, and parking. Yeah, really I'm not sure we're, we're looking to do something different, Jim, but I think she uh, Denise makes a good point. It's just something to point out to the residents. Hey, listen, for other other housing authorities and you have you, you're there at Bantam. Here's how we handle it over there. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to we're not going to do that here. Um, and I'm sorry that they, they can't be right next to each other, but. There's really no place in that whole place that's that far away from anything else. Really. No, and, and right? you know, they're they're outside yelling at each other and screaming at each other, and it's like, you know, the, the answer has to be the same, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. That's unfortunate. Yeah, it, and it's, um, you know, we want to be accommodating to the, the people that have the mobility issues and allow them to park where it's easily accessible um, without ticking anybody else off. But, you know, it, it tends, people are very funny about parking. And I deal with it at every single site. It's unbelievable um, how people think that they have their own spot but there's no assigned parking and get very upset when somebody takes what they think is their spot. Um, but I'll, I'll respond to both of them and tell them that, that this is, Pops. you know, moving forward, what, you know, th th that there's no assigned parking and, you know, every, and you kind of expand on that a little bit. Um, so that's, that's all I have in, in my report. Um, if we want to just jump down to unfinished business, th there's no update on the dwelling unit lease. Uh, we just haven't with, with COVID and, and limited hours in the office and, and everything. Um, <coughs> we, we haven't put that together, but we'll get into one other item that, um, we're concentrating on first. Um, the Eversource Incentive Program, we talked about, I'm going to remove that um, into our next meeting, that that project covered 75% of the, the heating upgrade in the community room. And then the Housing Authority Small Improvement Program, the asset money, um, is going to get scheduled soon for some of these items. And, and again, that's the security cameras, new doorbells for all the units, um, the, the maintenance shed that I mentioned at our last meeting and a new st stove and refrigerator for the community room. So that's the money that Gwen had said that she um, kind of allocated, got, got out of our check register, and, and we have all that money for, for those projects. Um, the maintenance shed, we just have to wait until the ground is thawed to, to do that. But all the other ones, you know, we're, we're, gonna, get, we're gonna get started on. Hey, Jim. Um, yes. Jim, did you uh, get any more complaints about the lighting, uh, the outside uh, lighting in the driveway? No. So, so the, the, from our last meeting, I, I think you're talking about that the, the outside lights, the time clocks weren't right. So I called yeah. um, oh, a few follow-ups from that meeting. I called uh, Tommy White because he, all, a lot of the light, time clocks are in the senior center. So they fixed all of those are working fine. Um, okay. After that meeting also, I talked to Lou Clark from Public Works about putting those, and I don't know what the residents called them, the, the night lines or whatever they are on the road. Um, mm -hmm. And he init initially said there's no funding for that, but he was doing <laughs> another project and there was extra. And so at a very low cost, um, the lines into Eldridge were painted. So we have um, th that whole that whole driveway has has yellow and white lines on it now. Um, okay, nice. Which was, which was excellent. Um, All right. So those were two, I know those were two kind of complaints or requests from that came out of the last meeting that were, at, that were done. Um, yep which was good. Okay. And then the other thing with Eversource is I'm gonna get into um, trying to change all of our pole lights to LEDs and, and the lighting over there is really funny because the senior center, which is the town, owns and maintains certain light poles. We as the housing authority own and maintain certain light poles and Eversource owns and maintains other ones. So um, the, the other piece of this energy um, kind of audit that I want to do is changing all the outside lights to LEDs that we own and operate. And that's going to change our um, electricity and make it even lower also. Oh, great. Um, so under new business, we hit A and C. We had Jocelyn um, talk about the, the town of Morris housing plan. And then Gwen and I talked about the state report. The one in the middle B is um, I'm on an email chain and continue to network with a lot of small housing authorities. And one of the things that came out of one of those 
emails was what they call a resident manual. And I know we have a tenant handbook, but this resident manual that it was from Vernon Housing um, was an excellent model to what I want to do um, in Morris and kind of take every all the rules and, and policies that we have plus town information, important information and put it in a resident manual. Um, and and it, they did a beautiful job on this. So I'm kind of taking that their template and, and adapting it to our situation. And then it's just gonna be a, a, a supply of information to the residents um, that are currently there. And then when you move in, you get this resident manual and, and it, it, it just kind of describes everything about the property um, and it, it really, I think it'll really work well, um, with, with the group that we, we have there. Um, that's all I have. I know we, we really wanted to concentrate with Jocelyn and, and Gwen on that stuff. Are there any questions, um, that anybody has for me? And like like I said, when when Gwen Gwen was here, the the finances, um, especially after we we received our last Eversource payment, and and we're getting a little bit more money in in terms of rent, have really, over I, I'd say. December through now have have really turned around, and kind of the next step. And I I talked to Gwen about it is if we continue to have no. Um, bills to pay, you know, if we stay current on, on our bills, which, which I, I don't see why we can't right now, um, is adding a payment to our reserve account on whatever time frame that we think we can do it with. Um, that's kind of the next step. Once you get your finances squared, squared away, start putting money in, in that reserve account. And, and I think that's... Um, kind of right around the corner. Great. Yeah, everything's good. Um, and I don't think there's a reason to go into executive session. There's nothing um, legally pending um, or, or anything personnel wise to, to go into. Um, so I think we can we can skip number eight. Okay. Yep. So you want a motion to adjourn the meeting? Yeah, just so everybody knows, um, Jim Lafreniere um, didn't feel well today, or he would have been here. Um, he called me right before the meeting. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think we're unless there's any any other business or or questions for me, um, we can get a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. And I second it. All opposed? That, I'm not opposed. So <laughs> 8.50, officially we're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night. Good night.